really are music? Wow, mm -hmm. that was great. Um, good evening and welcome to The Atheist Experience. This show is brought to you by The Atheist Community of Austin. I'm the host, Jeff D. My co-host is Martin Wagner, and our guest today is Dr. Alan Glasser, theoretical and computational plasma physicist working in fusion research at Los Alamos National Lab. Wow. Welcome to the show. Uh, we are live April 8, uh, 2001. The Atheist Community of Austin <coughs> is a nonprofit educational organization, uh, organization promoting positive mm. atheism and the separation of church and state. We have weekly meetings Sunday mornings at the Hot Jumbo Bagel Shop, 307 West 5th Street at 10.30 a.m., except for the first Sunday of each month when we have our lecture series at 11 a.m. in the Longhorn Room of Furs Cafeteria at North Cross Mall. ACA board meetings take place at noon right after our regular meeting on the second Sunday of every month. Those meetings are open to all ACA members, but you can only vote if you're on the board of directors. This was a board of directors meeting today, which I missed. And so did I. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Let's see. The Godless Gamer <coughs> every Thursday night at 7 o'clock at the home of Wendy Britton. Our ACA happy hour takes place at Waterloo Ice House on Burnett at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. For more information, you can call our voicemail number at 371-2911 or visit our website, www.atheist-community.org. Right mm. there on the screen, as uh, Martin just indicated. Huh. Well. Let's see. Let's skip some of that stuff. You got news? I got a little bit of news. Let's do some news. Yeah, I'm just going to do my uh, two most uh, uh, prominent news features uh, in order okay. to give the good doctor time to give his presentation, because he has a lot of interesting stuff to talk okay. about. Great. So, um... Hi, kids. Uh, here's the news for uh, Sunday, April the 8th. Uh, scientists discover secrets behind aging process. A common hormone-based mechanism seems to regulate the aging process in a variety of organisms. Scientists revealed in a finding that raises the possibility that hormonal therapy could add decades to the human lifespan. Three studies appearing in the journal Science show that the insulin signaling pathway, already known to regulate aging in roundworms, serves the same function in fruit flies and the simple life form yeast. Uh, scientists studying fruit flies at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, and University College London found that manipulating genes relating to insulin-like hormones greatly extended the insect's lifespan. But some of the flies, well, some of the flies lived up to 85% longer than usual, but the longer living flies were all dwarfs. There's a bit of a nasty side effect there. <laughs> Trade off there. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that might be a little bit more of a price than most people would be willing to pay. But anyway, quote, what's <laughs> exciting... twice as long, but be half as tall. <laughs> <laughs> what's exciting about these fi findings is that they suggest that there is a genetic system common to all animals that regulates aging, says David Gems hmm. of University College London. If we could just tap into the mammalian version of that system, it might be possible to retard or even reverse human aging at least in principle, it's an important qualifier, of course. Right. This uh, is still ongoing research. Sure, yeah. Uh, the findings hint at the possibility in the future of employing a type of hormonal treatment to extend the lifespan of people. Experiments involving mice suggested that about 40 healthy years could be added to the human lifespan. After 10 to 20 years of experiments, <laughs> scientists might have an idea of how to apply the results to people <laughs> without <laughs> involving... By then, 20 to 20 of my extra 40 years will be gone! Oh, darn. <laughs> well, yeah. So you'll just get to be, you know, just, you can still, you know, do the darn it. George Burns thing. And, like, you know, that's cool. Okay. Anyway, but, well, that's interesting. cigars. Yeah, that's interesting, and it's, of course, it's all highly theoretical and still in the experimental stage, but, hey, you know, it's neat. Um, the f now, every once in a while, I unearth a bit of news that just kind of makes you go, wow. And uh, this is one of those, I think. This is highly, I found this highly entertaining. Uh, you might not, but I have a weird sense of humor. It's our show, so yeah, you'll so just have to sit there and take it. Deal with it, yeah. Um, the former Bishop of Edinburgh, Scotland, said he no longer believed Jesus was the Son of God, quote, literally and biologically, and thought that the church was going down the tubes. The Most Reverend Richard Holloway, who retired as leader of the Scottish Episcopal Church in October, said he believed Jesus was simply, quote, an extraordinary man. The bishop chose to retire early as Primus of Scotland after clashing with the Archbishop of Canterbury and other conservative bishops over their teaching on homosexuality. Bishop Holloway has been a member of the lesbian and gay Christian movement for five years, but he is not homosexual. Uh, now free of his mitre, Bishop Holloway says he has experienced a, quote, seismic event in his thinking. That's how it usually works. And now sees the Bible and the church differently. The central Christian, this is a great part. 
Now, central Christian claims, he said, were, quote, metaphors for living a good and humane life, and that asking people to believe them at face value is like asking people to believe that the Emperor Alexander, quote, had a three-hour piss one afternoon in the sands of Arabia. <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> wow. That's like, now, was that a common myth over in England? I, I don't know, but... Uh, oh, very, very strange. It, yeah, so uh, it's just uh, thing, wacky things going on over there in the British Isles. Now, so, was he, was, what was his title? You said the, He was the former the, Bishop of Edinburgh. The, the most reverend. Shouldn't he be the not-quite-as-reverend yeah. Richard Holloway now? The reverend not the, appearing the in this film. The formerly reverend. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. So, uh, this, uh, yeah, this guy has been a bit of a controversial fixture in the British uh, religious community for some time and a bit of, a, bit of an embarrassment to them because uh, he says, makes these indelicate remarks that, uh, that make them uncomfortable. So, uh, <laughs> this, but I, it's just one of those where you, I read that, and just, whew, you know, just... Uh, can I, think, can I do a, just a short pseudoscience news thing? You can, because uh, I'm... We didn't get to this last week. Yeah, you can, because I'm done. I know we're short on time today, but it's yeah. just quite short, and it's, it's, uh, it's pseudoscience news, which is near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. Princess Diana swore by the healing power of crystals, while Cherie Blair always wears hers at a, as a pendant around her neck to warn off harmful rays from computers and mobile phones. <laughs> but that faith, shared by a host of other celebrities, was yesterday exposed as a myth by a new study, and that's yesterday, a week ago, I'm afraid. Thank you. Um, scientists addressing the first day of the British Psychological Society's Centenary Conference compared the reactions of a group who were told to meditate while cr clutching real crystals bought from New Age shops with others who were unknowingly given fakes made from paste. Mm while those with the genuine article reported an uplifting increase in concentration powers, heightened energy levels, and better spiritual well-being, exactly the same feelings were reported by those who held the fake crystals. That's such an obvious test. I'm amazed no one ever thought of it before. It's like the thing that the little uh, grade school girl did with therapeutic touch of a couple of years back. Right, yeah, just um, simple double blinding. Uh, Dr. Christopher French at Goldsmiths College London, who led the research, said, the power of suggestion, either explicit or implicit, seems to be the not-so-mysterious power that may convince many that crystals have the potential to work miracles. Yeah. You've heard what their response to one of like Britain's leading New Age figures was to this, this study. He said, oh, well, they just weren't given the right kind of crystals. <laughs> Which is like, but wait but, a minute, but they but reported they, but the they right results. That they worked. And so that, so that clearly is the point. Yeah, that's the whole thing. So it was, it was right. really, really amusing. Well, let's have some... Uh, Let's have the views of an actual scientist. Yeah, let's hear a little. We're just uh, we're just a couple of artists and it's physics game time. guys uh, yeah. with a, with an atheist TV show. Um, uh, Dr. Glasser, welcome to the show. Thank it's you. A, it's a pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Um, the floor is yours. Okay. I'm an atheist. Um, the word atheist means without God, nothing more, nothing less. Um, there is no atheist pope. There's no atheist church. There's nobody who can tell me what a good atheist is supposed to believe. So all I'm going to tell you about is what I believe. Um, um, it's actually kind of hard to <laughs> right, right. get it just right okay. for everyone. Um, yeah. <laughs> when I say without God, what's primarily in my mind is uh, the... Western Judeo-Christian God, uh, by which I mean some supreme being who was responsible for creating the universe and who can intervene in the universe and is himself uh, uh, all-knowing, all-powerful, uh, all-good. Uh, so this is what I mean I, when I say I don't believe in him, it, um, and... In my understanding, when religious people turn to God and to religion, they do so in search of answers to two classes of questions, questions of fact and questions of value. Um, what is and what ought. Mm -hmm. uh, since I reject God and religion, I want to tell you what I turn to instead, because uh, even atheists have questions about these big things. Uh, as a scientist, a physicist, uh, I find it natural to turn 
to science uh, to answer questions of fact. And there are big questions. Where did the world come from, the universe? Uh, where did life come from? Where do we come from? Where do we go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I want to tell you some of the answers that I find in science. Uh, and th th in some sense, you could regard these as stories, just like Bible stories. But the difference in science is that these stories are rooted in things that we can observe and in our own uh, logic, our own reason. Uh, science appeals to observation, logic, reason. Uh, and unlike religion, where the, um, the answers come to us uh, sort of packaged and in a way that we're not supposed to question, uh, in science, the name of the game is questioning. Everybody is allowed to question. And uh, the strength of science is that uh, uh, with everybody questioning the answers, there's a constant renewal of our understanding and a deepening of it. The, uh, there are always frontiers to what we understand. And what we can hope to do over long periods of time is to constantly push back these frontiers. There is never a time when there isn't a frontier. There are always things that we don't know, that we don't understand. And I want to give you some examples. Uh, our best understanding of the overall history of the universe is that our known universe originated in a Big Bang. Why do we believe this? Is this just like, and God created uh, the universe out of nothing? Uh, well, let me tell you how we know this. Um, here on Earth, if we take a strip of copper, or in fact any element, and put it in a flame, and if we pass the light from that flame through a prism or diffraction grating, spreading it out into its separate colors, we see patterns. We see stripes of dark and light. And these patterns are like fingerprints that we can use to recognize the individual elements. Mm -hmm. If we turn our most powerful telescopes on the most distant galaxies, we see these same patterns indicating that they're made of the same elements, but with a major difference, which is that the patterns appear all to be shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. Uh, this is the red shift. Uh, we understand why they're shifted toward the red. It's the Doppler eff effect. Uh, you may have experienced this effect if you've ever stood by a railroad track and seen a train go by with its whistle on. What you hear is because when the train is rushing towards us, the sound is upshifted toward a higher pitch, and when it's going away from us, it's downshifted toward a lower pitch. The same thing happens with light, because light is a wave, just like uh, sound. Mm -hmm. And the faster something is moving away from us, uh, the more these patterns are shifted toward the red. Mm -hmm. Then we see something very interesting also, which is that the further away one of these galaxies is, the faster it's receding. We can understand that in terms of the whole universe expanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can use the relationship between distance and velocity uh, to, to estimate how long ago the whole thing came from a point. Mm -hmm. And that was the Big Bang. And that happened 13 billion years ago or thereabouts. Give or take a yeah. <laughs> few hundred uh, years. Well, <clears throat> that's one line of evidence. There are two more. A second line of evidence is that, well, back in 1965, there were these two guys in Holmdel, New Jersey at Bell Labs with a microwave horn. This was in the early days of satellite communications. They were perfecting their microwave horn. They had hiss that they didn't know where it came from. Uh, they thought for a while that it might be pigeon droppings. <laughs> it yeah. turned out that uh, 
this hiss uh, came from outer space. And it was the same whether you turned the horn this way or this way. In other words, it was completely independent of direction. Huh. And we take this hiss now, we understand this hiss, to be uh, uh, like the afterglow of the Big Bang. Hmm. It's microwave radiation, very low frequency. It corresponds to a temperature of three degrees above absolute zero. But uh, what happened was that the, when the universe expanded, it went from uh, fantastically hot mm -hmm. to this very low temperature because uh, over these 13 billion years, it has had that much time to cool off uh, mm -hmm. because of the expansion. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, we can use the temperature of this radiation today to estimate how long it took for it to reach this temperature, and we get the same answer, 13 billion years. Mm -hmm. The fact that these two very different sources give us such similar answers uh, uh, bolsters our confidence that we have the right answer. There's a third line of evidence that I'll touch on very briefly, which is that we can calculate uh, uh, if the whole universe was originally made of the simplest element, which is hydrogen, and that hydrogen burned up in the Big Bang to produce helium, we can compute the ratio of hydrogen to helium, and it comes out right, uh, oh. according to these other two models. Oh, okay. uh, so that's our best understanding of where the universe comes from. Using our best understanding of elementary particle physics, we can understand what happened in that Big Bang back to 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Wow. That's pretty early. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's not zero. Right. <laughs> That's an example of the limits of our knowledge. Mm -hmm. Why can't we go back before that? Well, I can tell you a couple of things. One of them is that uh, uh, our knowledge of the deepest physics fails us before 10 to the minus 43 seconds. We don't know how things work when they were that hot and dense. That's because there's a complicated interaction between quantum mechanics and general relativity that nobody has ever figured out. I might say that here in Austin is a center for understanding that. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, so how do we scientists deal with the uncertainty that comes before the 10 to the minus 43 seconds? Could we say that before that, that's when God created the universe? Uh, Part of the scientific orientation is that when we don't know what happened, when we have no evidence for what happened, we don't make up stories. Uh, we wait until we've learned more, and we keep on trying to learn more. So much for where the universe came from in our understanding. Uh, a second question is, uh, where did life come from, and, how, and where did we come from? There are two a answers I can give you to this from uh, uh, science. One of them is Darwinian natural selection. What Darwin taught us is that uh, uh, more complex things can evolve from simpler things by a really simple and understandable mechanism. Today, when we have huge controversies with Christian fundamentalists, uh, who want to obscure this message, uh, it seems like it must be very complicated to understand, and in fact, it's very simple to understand. Uh, the, the, we can understand this in terms of frogs. Uh, a single frog can lay thousands of eggs. Uh, if all of those eggs became mature frogs, the earth would very quickly be covered with frogs. And it isn't. Why not? Because uh, there are limited resources, limited food, water, air, space for frogs. Uh, and so not all of these frogs can survive. They have to compete with each other for scarce resources. Uh, among all these thousands of frogs, um, there are minor differences. And because of these minor differences, some of these frogs are stronger than others, smarter than others, faster than others, hungrier than others. <laughs> and um, uh, <clears throat> the better ones beat out the worse ones, and they pass on their genes to the next generation. So 
the frogs are constantly improving. Amoebas are constantly improving. Uh, 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 humans are constantly improving. Yeah. And over the f uh, th what we think might be about 3.8 billion years since life originated, there's been a lot of time for a lot of improvement. And uh, we believe that that is an adequate explanation. How did it get started? That's another subject. In fact, Darwin touched on that subject, but very little. He described a warm little pond where uh, non-living things eventually evolved into living things by mechanisms he didn't understand. Uh, there is a recent theory which, to me, is a very intellectually satisfying, although I have to say that we don't really have experimental uh, proof that this is uh, the right answer. Uh, there's a chemical thing called a catalyst. There's a very simple example of this which explains the destruction of the ozone layer. Uh, Man-made um, fluorochlorocarbon uh, carbons mm -hmm get up into the stratosphere and release the carbon atoms. Two ozone atoms stick to a chlorine atom. And when they come into contact through the chlorine atom, they uh, turn into three oxygen atom, uh, molecules. Uh, um, and then they let go of the chlorine, which releases it to go on and do it again, so that a single chlorine atom can destroy a zillion uh, uh, chlorine, uh, um, ozone molecules. Imagine, again with Darwin's warm little pond, that uh, you have, uh, and, and this doesn't need to be a pond, it could be a deep sea volcanic vent, or in fact, uh, in a recent theory by Tommy Gold, in a book called The Deep Hot Biosphere, he uh, argues that there's a whole biosphere living in the interstices of the rocks uh, b below the surface and living on upwelling primordial hydrocarbons. Uh, the, in any of these locales, you could have, s among a zillion different species of molecules, you could have a molecule A which catalyzes the formation of another molecule B. And a molecule B could then catalyze the formation of a C, and C catalyzes D, and so on, until perhaps at some point you come to a molecule Z, which catalyzes the formation of molecule A, closing the loop. That closing of the loop is like a crystallization, which could be the first living molecule. Because once that molecule is formed, it can make innumerable copies of itself, and then you have competition mm -hmm. for scarce resources. You have minor variations from one generation to the next, and Darwinian uh, natural selection sets in, and that can take us all the way to ourselves. Hmm. I think that's enough said about questions of fact. Mm -hmm. Just as everybody else, we atheists, we scientists, also have big questions of value. Uh, among Christians, among uh, uh, Western religion believers, uh, there's an answer for where, what is the source, what is the origin of value, which is God gave it to us. God decreed what is good, uh, what is right. And uh, I find the problem in believing this because uh, I can think of two ways to interpret what that means, and neither one of them makes sense to me. The, uh, the first way is to say that anything God defines to be good is by definition good, and we have to accept it because he's the boss. Um, <laughs> well, even in the Bible, in Genesis, there are cases where God has decreed what is to be done, which I feel are reprehensible. Uh, an example is that when Moses and Aaron and Joshua came back from uh, slavery in Egypt to conquer the land of Canaan, um, 
God gave them instructions as to how to rape and pillage and murder. Mm -hmm. um, because God was giving the Jews that land, and the Canaanites who were there before had no right to it. Uh, thank you, but I find that reprehensible. And I feel that I have the right to regard it as such. Um, another example, is, again in the book of Genesis, is where uh, Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, the uh, sister of Jacob's 12 sons, uh, falls in love with a non-Jew. Mm -hmm. And his family comes to her family and says, our son loves your daughter and wants to marry her. Uh, we would like you to accept him. And uh, the sons of Jacob gathered together and formed a plan. They went back to the man's family and they said, you, uh, we will accept you if you will convert to Judaism. And to convert to Judaism, you must be circumcised. Uh, this is not a pleasant thing to go through as an adult. It may not be a pleasant thing to go through as a baby, but we <laughs> don't hear much about that. Uh, when uh, uh, they agreed to this, and they were recovering in pain in their tents. The sons of Jacob fell upon them and slew them. And they <laughs> thought they were doing the will of God. Yeah. Perhaps they were mistaken. I regard that as reprehensible. Yeah. So are we required to accept the word of God because he's the boss? Another possible alternative is that God is good. God couldn't tell us that something reprehensible is in fact uh, good because he adheres to a higher standard. Uh, if, if that's the answer, then really God's endorsement of that higher standard is irrelevant. What matters is the higher standard. Uh, to me, when I seek the source of goodness, the source of value, uh, it's to be found by looking inside myself. And all of us find our sources of value by looking inside of ourselves. Uh, I have to tell you that I'm not entirely satisfied with my own answer to this. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't know a good response to somebody like a Hitler who tells me that when he looks inside himself, he finds goodness in killing Jews and gypsies and Slavs. Uh, I don't know how to tell him that what he experiences as good, I experience as evil. And of course, I can stop him by brute force, but um, what if he wins? <laughs> oh. that, that, <clears throat> that should do it. Uh, <laughs> Well, we've got a wow, lot of was, uh, uh, callers on the line. That's a that was excellent. That, that was an excellent presentation. Yeah. Um, and let's go straight to these callers. Yeah. Talk to Ms. Mary. Hello, Mary. Hi. Hi. What can the we do for you, Mary? Uh, well, the level of intellect, I, I just can't resist calling when it's this good, okay? <laughs> there's not a lot of opinion here, and I don't listen to very much opinion anymore, unless it's Vladimir Nabokov or somebody like that. And there's not that many of them. So let's get back to reality, <laughs> which I find science to be. Um, I watched a debate just earlier on book TV about biomedical ethics, and they're dealing with the question of value on, a few people are dealing with it on a real profound level, which is something we should all be doing, okay, because it's an, a very important issue. I think pretty much the future turns on it because they're doing some things uh, with biomedicine that are like medicine for medical futility and things like that that are really, really ethically questionable. But what I really called about was uh, I watched the debate on human cloning on C-SPAN a few nights ago. I had to stay up till 5 o'clock in the morning to see that whole thing. But in the end, it paid off for me big time because I understand w recently they found a lot of problems with cloning that a lot of the... Um, uh, clones have problems with them you yeah, know like and dying. they die or they get sick or whatever they're not they, the immune system's not there or whatever what, what i figured out is that 
it gets to natural selection again. The natural selection that's taking place in mitosis and meiosis, which is the basic cell reproduction, where the, that, where the cells become a zygote, where the ovum and the sperm become a zygote, is that that's where the natural selection is taking place where the best genes, the strongest genes, are being sorted together to produce the best organism that it possibly can, you know, without, without uh, politicization and all of those other things. This is just true biological science. And that's where the problem is with human cloning, and that's where we, the question of values comes back. If you bypass natural selection, what you're saying is that, well, this person is worth cloning more than this person. And we, we really can't, we're really not there to make those kind of judgments yet because we're so politicized. Okay, I'll use a, 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 a neutral word. We're so politicized by our, our history and our social views and prejudices okay i'll get to that word mm -hmm. <laughs> it's there that we're really not in a position right now to be making those kind of choices where we i'm not saying stop the research i'm saying don't expect more from it right now than it it's possible to get from it okay well, that's well, all i wanted to okay. say okay do you have any reactions to that well, I mean, was this a, was this a big concern that was being voiced? To like, for example, on the debate on C-SPAN, they were afraid that <clears throat> human cloning might be just this new tool for eugenics to create some kind of master race or something. I, I, um, was was this is this a big ethical concern? Because I that was there, and I'll uh, tell you who was there that made me really kind of laugh. You know, Rael, that guy. That oh boy! Oh, the, yeah, yeah. The Ra we were just talking about Raelians before we went on the air. Yeah, just... he was on there talking to Congress about. But what the problem with him being there was that he's just doing it for money. Okay. Well, yeah, he's doing for it to games. promote his, his his. Can I make a comment? Sure. Yeah, Absolutely. Please, please. Um, my understanding of the problem with human cloning, or in fact any cloning, is that uh, when you take a cell. Uh, which is not uh, sort of uh, originally uh, uh, destined to be a, uh, you, know, you know, the source of a new life. Uh, there are genes which are naturally turned on in a human zygote and are not turned on in these uh, clone cells. Right. And uh, the result of this is that really the scientists who are doing this don't understand yet how to work it right. They don't know how to make things turn on in the right order. And mm -hmm. so things get screwed up. Mm -hmm. There's another thing that I've read about, which is that uh, um, if you take human cells and culture them in a medium like agar and uh, uh, let them divide and divide and divide, uh, it turns out that there's a limit on right. how many the times they can divide. Yeah. Right, we talked uh, about that. And yeah. uh, if you clone, a, a whole organism from an adult cell, uh, you are looking at a reduced number of remaining uh, divisions that are possible, and so such an organism would have a shortened lifespan. Uh, it's okay, I guess, to experiment on this sort of thing uh, with uh, laboratory animals, but I can see that there would be moral concerns about creating a human like this. Yeah, it only lived for you know, a couple of years, perhaps, yeah, right? Right, right. Because that's what's happening with all the sheep that. and the cattle that have been cloned. It's like they, you know, they just they die and kill over very quickly, and, yeah. and they right. sing fine, and then I, in my my comment uh, just to to kind of close this off is that um, if we if we cloned a human being and what we got was a kid with heart problems who and and uh, and shortened telomeres in his cells that were going to limit his his potential lifespan, that's a bad thing because it's a horrible waste of that effort. It's going to be a, a horrible life for that child, right? But those are the reasons. Yeah. The actual real effects of what we do are the reasons, you know, on which we should decide whether we should do it or not. Right. And not some <clears throat> guy in the sky who has some problem with it or has reserved the power to make human beings for himself. 
Right. Okay. No problem with that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your call, Mary. And that is uh, the the main. Uh, there was a recently, uh, um, you know, Time Magazine did an article recently on human cloning, and mm -hmm. a poll that was done uh, among people who objected to human cloning. The overwhelming majority of them objected to it for religious reasons. Yeah. And those there are plenty of sound reasons to object to human cloning, uh, but those aren't. Uh, those really aren't the valid ones. Uh, so right. you're right. I think it's 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 the consequences of your actions that determine the actual consequences. Precisely. Right? I so mean, when 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 automobiles were invented, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they only caught on after many many automobiles that weren't very reliable and broke down a lot, you know. And, or and planes. It was Good it grief. was re refined and, or airplanes, right? Yeah. I mean, any new idea like that. Uh, does not catch on, does not become a good idea for us to engage in, you know, on some kind of massive scale until it works. Yeah. And that's really the same question. I mean, the difference here is that a broken car is just a piece of machinery, right? right? And a broken human embryo is potentially, a, a, you know, a, a person that might have yeah. to live with that problem himself. And that's not good. Let's go on to the next call. Mr. Reed. Reed? Yes, sir. Hi, Reed. What can we do for you? Sorry to keep you waiting so long. No problem. Yeah, thanks for staying uh, on the line. I uh, have a question. If uh, there is no God and uh, the human mind creates right and wrong or these ideas of good and evil, then, then why are people who are murdered? I mean, why should we even care about them at all? I mean, ultimately, our birth is an accident, our death is an accident, our life is an accident. You know, the ultimate solution or the ultimate end to, to, to atheism is despair. Why, well, say, that's for what instance, you think. Madeline Murray O'Hare, why that. should I care if she was okay. murdered? Okay. Uh, I mean, because it's survival of the fittest, right? I mean, we'll, how would you we'll can handle that. that? Okay, wait a minute. Uh, uh, well, I want to take this myself. <laughs> um, uh, survival of the fittest, that phrase is actually a, a rather unfortunate oversimplification of what evolution is about. But, but even given that, all right, if... if, if if, just because survival of the fittest happens, just because evolution actually occurs, and less fit beings are weeded out by nature and don't pass on their genes with as great frequency, and so the more fit ones tend to survive, just because that happens, that is not some kind of imperative on us to act likewise. Volcanoes explode. That actually happens, you know. Lava runs down mountainsides and wipes out villages and kills people. Does right. that mean that we should do likewise? No. I mean, the fa un unpleasant facts, you know, uh, about the the savageness of of uncontrolled nature are just facts. None of them are instructions on how we ought to behave. Okay. To answer your original question, I don't I, I I don't think it's a question of what of what we should do. It's a question of what we do do. We do, in fact feel bad when people are un, uh, suffer unnecessary pain and suffering. We do, in fact, feel that way. And the reason we do, I, I think, is because we're evolved from many, many, many generations of social creatures that needed certain emotional impulses to get along and work together. But, but the fact is, that's what we are. And those are, that is the way we feel. Well, there are and some... it's why, why, why reject what our actual feelings are in favor of latching on to some, you know, misguided, uh, you know, just uh, parroting back of the way that, that, it, it, that, uh, that nature, which has no mind and no, uh, no goals of its own and just churns along doing what it does, it, that makes no sense to me. Yeah, and I don't, and I don't understand the, uh, the, the basis for, for reaching the conclusion that whatever the means of our coming into existence were was whether it was by the result of a divine uh, act or whether we are simply evolved organisms from 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 uh, from nature what that has to do with how we feel about how we live our lives day to day why why should one one fact cause us to be any happier or less happy than the other fact the fact of the matter is we're here we have lives to live day to day and because we are sentient beings, you know, we seek uh, pleasure in that experience, and we seek to, not only for ourselves, but for the people around us, we seek to have a happy and fulfilling existence. And, and whether we were put here by a god who felt like putting us here, or whether we're, we're the result of some form of natural process, I don't see should have any bearing on how one uh, views one's happiness at the simple fact of being alive. I, I, I've never understood the, this whole idea that one must believe in, in, a, in a deity 
to have a sense of happiness or purpose. Well, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about well, yeah, where you said does that the right end result and of wrong it, come from? Well, you Who said, defines right and wrong? If we do. If it's human mind, in fact, then in why fact, is we do. your definition mm -hmm. any better than mine? I mean, what, let's say you walk out of the studio well, well, and somebody blows you well, away. What's why is happen? that wrong? Well, here, let me, I'll, can, can I answer, Reed? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, Reed, here's, here's the difference. Okay, it's... I think it's a, there's one explanation, okay, for example, to say that because we're, the naturalistic explanation, which is because we're social beings, we have to formulate certain behaviors that benefit each other in order for our species to, evolve, to survive. Okay. We all have to work together to survive, and this is how when, as you said, if you walk out and someone shoots you and kills you, well, this is understood as being, oh, well, like killing other people results in their being killed, so that's a thing we shouldn't do. I have a and it's, a, it's an observable fact, okay? It's, it's an action that results in a consequence that we can observe, and we make our moral and ethical decisions based upon that. Dr. And Russell? the KKK yeah, I, has one definition, the Nazi German has another definition. Well, who's to say who is right? Dr. I, Glasser? Yeah, I would say that uh, we should regard Darwinian natural selection as applying to groups of people as well as individuals. And if you could imagine two groups of people, one of which had mutually caring behavior and the other of which was a war of every man against every man, then it, uh, it's clear that the second group of people would quickly uh, go to extinction while the first would thrive. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it, it's simply a matter of the same natural selection that groups that uh, experience feelings of altruism, uh, love for each other, will thrive better than uh, others. Yeah, and so if you're, I guess my question, doctor, to you would be, if you're a, a black man in, in uh, 1800s or 1700s America, I mean, why is it wrong that you're a slave? I mean, there are people today who stand on, you know, civil rights and, and human rights and equal rights and all that. Why is that wrong? Because society says that, you know, you're two-fifths the value of white folks. I think you are uh, confusing two different issues. If you are a black man in 1750, let's say, and you are being held down by superior force, if you are a Jew in Nazi Germany and being held down by superior force, the, the, the issue is not one of right or wrong, but of one of force. Uh, uh, I mean, I know if I am a Jew in not Nazi Germany that what's being done to me is wrong. Uh, I may not have the power to stop it. Mm -hmm. But why is it wrong? How do you decide that that is wrong? By whose definition is that wrong? It's I'm not sure. wrong to the Nazi well, German. By his own definition. Let me ask you a question. You mentioned the KKK. It, d does the does the Ku Klux Klan run the, the United States? Um, no, right? What does that have to they're, do with anything? Well, I'm, I'm going somewhere this. Just, right. just, just play along, okay? <laughs> uh, they don't run the United States. They're a weird little fringe. Well, how come they're a weird little fringe? They're a weird little fringe because the vast majority of people look at them and go, Ew! That's <laughs> horrid! Right? So now, why do people go that morality. way? Why do people, why do people react that way? Well, there are two main reasons. One is that in, it, we have shared inherited instincts that in most people lead us to be repulsed by the kind of behavior that those people display. And the other one is that we have a society where the, the general consensus is that, you know, people of all races have equal rights, right, and have equal value. Right. How would you answer now, the question of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King in the 1960s when his society said, ooh, to the black man, yeah. you, you, and, and there was a tremendous pressure against uh, the black folks and right. oppression mm -hmm. in the 1960s. And, and, they, and, and there was then, and then there was, and then there was, and now we have equal, more equal And there was today. then what? Competition between those different points of view. And the one, that, the point of view that won was his, because his point of view was the one that worked better. But he didn't right? live More in the 1990s people... or the year 2000. I mean, it's he... very true. This so, is a... so, I mean, it, 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 there could be 
horrifyingly evil things about our culture that most of us take for granted and think are perfectly okay. And there could be minorities living among us right now who look at what most of us are doing and say, ew! And when they get their word out and their point of view on what is right and wrong be, uh, competes with the prevailing one, it may be that in a few generations, that their point of view will be on top, and that will be what is widely regarded as right and wrong. That's just the way it works. Yeah, I think what you're illustrating is just a very simple uh, fact that uh, times, times and attitudes do change. Um, we're constantly part of being the kind of species that we are, this socially interactive species, is that we're, we are a part of uh, the, the end result of our interacting with one another all the time, is that we're learning things. And, and, and we're growing, and, and not just simply as individual human beings, but as a species. Um, we, we, we're not infallible, of course, and, and there will always, of course, be prime misfits out there rocking the boat. Um, so there is that factor of individualism. But overall, so society has these behavioral and cultural trends that are formed when new attitudes are, as Jeff indicated, brought to the fore, and people begin to realize you're right. We should rethink this idea. Maybe it's not right to own people in bondage as slaves. Maybe it's not right to deny people economic uh, or professional opportunities because of creed or skin color. Maybe it's not right to pay women differently than less than men, even if they're doing the same job. Maybe we yeah, should. Yeah, that one we're still worth struggling with. And we're with. still struggling with that one. So, <laughs> you know? so it, it's, a, it's a constant process that, right. that we're going through, and we're learning from one another. And uh, the question that you bring up, of course, is a valid one. Who decides what's right and what's wrong, and, and why is it wrong? Why, why is what's right now wrong 50 or 100 years ago? The, um, those are questions that sociologists ponder all the time, and, and the answer is we're working on it. We have to keep working on it and work together. That's how we survive. So, so okay, thanks a lot for your call, Reed. So I hope we uh, we answered your question, Reed. Okay, let's go to Steve. Line three. Steve? Hey, how you doing? All right. We're good. How are you, Steve? I'm doing okay. I'd like to uh, follow up on that last call. It's quite interesting. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Looks like you guys are saying that majority, the majority of people will make the decision for society. Is well, that correct? Well, that is what happens. That is what happens. So, so when we were in slavery days back uh -huh. in the 1860s, yeah. that you're saying that in that particular time frame, the majority opinion was that slavery was okay. Was, was that false? That Th that was the majority opinion. And, and you agree that, that there's nothing wrong with that because the majority agreed that that was okay. No, we're not saying no. there's nothing were wrong I, with it. Were I to travel back in time, I would be horrified. Yeah. We're not saying so, that uh, so what's... now, what you guys are telling me is that now you've defined what I would consider to be a moral absolute. You have, have we? declared uh, that that's morally wrong. So you've got a conscience that's deciding, making a factor in your mind, come up with a decision that slavery is wrong, and what Hitler did was wrong. By the way, Hitler did embrace Darwinism to a, the highest extreme. And he also embraced Christianity, but okay. Well, he said that killing Jews was doing the Lord's work, but well, that's he, beside he the used, point. He well, let's, let's not go, all oh, right, never mind. Let's not cut on the path. But okay. my, my point is that, stick to your point. that you guys have agreed that there are moral absolutes. Now, no, my we haven't. You no, we is, haven't. We well, have said nothing about moral absolutes. So what's wrong with, with actually going and committing a murder? Because well, why is that why, wrong? Why don't you, what do you think is what wrong is, with committing What is murder? wrong with going and killing a murder? You I'm tell asking us. You, the question. you tell us why. I just asked you the question you, for you to answer. Well, I can, I can tell you. I just want to see if my answer would jive with yours. Well, go ahead. I asked okay. you first. My answer is what's wrong with committing a murder is that it results in someone dying. Okay? Well, That's what I think is. What's wrong with that? What's wrong you, with that? You believe that there's, are you there's, seriously telling us you think there's nothing wrong with somebody dying? No, I'm not saying that. Yeah. So why are you what, asking us that question? Because, why are you pretending to disagree with us? Because there is no God, and yeah. there are no, there, your life was an accident, yeah. your death is an accident, and we're here, we're just an evolved... If there is a God, there are no moral moment, absolutes. Hold on. We're just there is nothing about mortal slime. Would you, would you so mind you have repeating no the section of your life. presentation that explains... Why a god, a god, the a existence of a god does not create moral abs, uh, uh, real moral absolutes. Say it again. I didn't hear. Oh, uh, if you don't mind, okay. I'll. Uh, you or me? You may, if you'd like to, okay. just do it what, again. You did it so good the first time. All right. What I said uh, was that we have a choice in uh, interpreting the idea that God gives us values. 
the first choice would be to say anything he says goes because he's the boss and we have to accept it whether we like it or not the second possibility is that if he says something is good it's good not because he says so but because he's adhere adhering to a higher standard if that's the case then his endorsement of that higher standard is really beside the point the higher standard is the thing we should be focusing on uh, so to me it makes no sense to say that this God uh, gives us uh, the word on what's uh, what's good what's right what's what's valuable okay yes, in, in right. so, okay fine so see that's what I thought you guys were saying so you yeah. basically determine what's wrong and what's right no, I didn't say but, that we determine that okay Actually, well what is what do you mean well, we all my, do. my view is everybody has to determine it for himself by looking inside himself and okay fine I determined that this person's life is not valuable uh -huh. and I destroy that person now what why is in that some wrong? sense uh, in well, some sense I agree with you about the dilemma the fact is that for example when Hitler looked inside himself he saw that it was right to kill Jews and Slavs and gypsies and, uh, and blacks and, and African Americans and handicapped yeah. people that's part of Darwin's Darwinism that we went in and tried to eliminate <laughs> yes, I don't know where I, you get I, that I, idea. I, I agree with you that this is a, a, a this is a philosophical <laughs> problem to which I don't think is we this have that, a good, Steve? good I don't solution. Know. It's one of the here's here in fact in All right. in uh it's in fact it has a name in philosophy. Uh -huh. It's called the Euthyphro dilemma. What? Which is if you ex if you accept the notion that morals are a code of behavior handed to us by a god, then there are two issues that you need to resolve immediately. For well well, actually one. And that is where did God get these moral precepts from and why these moral precepts and not others? Either he came up with these moral precepts himself, he just, he just decided thou shalt not kill, in which case he just came up with that, in which case it's every bit as arbitrary as it would be if we all as a culture just decided murder should be illegal because we think it's wrong. The other possibility would be, the yeah, and but the other possibility be right would be because you think it's right. Well, the other possibility would be that God got these moral precepts from somewhere. Oh, God which got them from somewhere. Which no, would no, no, that's not what we're saying. Oh, okay. We're saying okay. these no, are the, no, wait, I'm going to stop you there, Martin, because you're just repeating yeah. what uh, Dr. Glasser just said. I, yeah, I'm just trying to make it. Where oh, uh, do you? Uh, let me ask you a question, caller. Do you think more that uh, moral that there are moral absolutes? Absolutely. You do think that there are moral absolutes. Where do they come from? I think they come from God. Where does he get them? I don't know the answer. Okay. So you think that there are moral absolutes, but you don't know where they come from. No, you have I no idea they why God. they are why they are absolutes. Well, why do you feel that murder I'm is asking wrong? you now. No, it's my turn. I'm asking you now. I've already answered the question. Okay. You don't know. Okay. I told when you, you I know, they, you they... call us back and when you can explain your position to us, we'll take you seriously. I've already How's explained that? my position to me. You. Okay. I told you they come from God, and they're printed out for you in black and white in the Bible. And why? And where did he uh, get these moral precepts from? There's, there's I don't. Mein have the Kampf to is that. also printed out for me in black and white. If I cared to read that particular hideous book, yeah. Right. I mean, that being printed in black and white is not the issue. How come the set of moral absolutes that you adhere to? How come you think those are the are the real absolutes and really count? Well, that's a why because that's an extremely long answer and it'll take up the rest of your show. We can go into <laughs> we can go into archaeological evidence to support the Bible, but that's so not you're, my question. So, uh, but your, your argument would boil down to because you think you've got proof that there, this God actually exists. I have I will grant you for a moment that your God, me. I will grant you for sake of argument, your God actually exists. Now tell me how come that list of moral absolutes in the Bible is the one unquestionable uh, set of moral absolutes. Where do you How think come? we got our laws, guys? Where do you we think made them we up. Where do you think kill? we got them? Where we made we them up. Laws? I'm asking you, where did the laws come that are on our books today in uh. all the states around America? I'd like you to answer the question. Mm -hmm. I would like to read to you something from Thomas Jefferson. I guess you're not going to answer Christian the question. The Christian God can easily be pictured as virtually the same God as the many ancient religions and ancient gods of past civilizations. The Christian God is a three-headed monster, cruel, vengeful, and capricious. If one wishes to know more of this raging, three-headed beast-like God, <laughs> wow. one only needs to look at the caliber of the people who serve him. They are always of two classes, fools and hypocrites. Thomas Jefferson. Uh. So if you intend to argue 
that, our, that this is a Christian nation and that, that our laws all come from the Bible. You are completely full of it, caller. Well, you want to tell me where the laws come from then, Mr. Yeah, we yeah. make them up. We've been going over this. You we know, make, you them, make up. them up. We make them up. Based we make them up based on what, how, based on our opinions about, about the, well, not even. Uh, about, uh, based on our opinions of how good certain kinds of behaviors are for us individually, for our culture, for our society. Uh, for our ability to get along with other people. And we so we, look at we the people of the United States in order to create Nazism, a more perfect union. That Nazism yeah. and, and the elimination of the African Americans, the handicap, yeah, the mentally handicapped, as right. well as the Jews, yeah. how right. can you explain to me that that was wrong? Be uh, okay, caller, or we're going to let you go and, and answer we're going to answer you again. we got five minutes left. Have a comment? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Amanda, Most quickly. Most of the moral things in the Christian and Judeo-Christian Bible and other books are taken cribbed from the Code of Hammurabi, written by Babylonians. Okay. Um, written in stone. Yeah. Amanda's reminding us that mu much Egypt of the much by of pharaohs who were called gods and believed because they thought okay. They were we have gods. to cut you off. Uh, Amanda's reminding us that, uh, in case that didn't come on in, uh, out over the speakers, that much of the uh, the many of the rules in the Bible were cribbed from Hammurabi and other earlier sources. Yeah. The point is, caller, that we make uh, we, we we decide what uh, what works, what we think is reasonable, and when there are problems, people complain and they get heard to a greater or lesser extent, depending on what kind of government we're running. Right? Oh, in the olden days, it was much more difficult for somebody who disagreed with the standard morals of the day to get heard and taken seriously. Now we have mass communications, we have much more uh, uh, equal rights for everyone, people get, a, get more of a hearing, and we work on it. And that's really the only answer. Yeah, and it's based on the observable fact that actions have consequences. And if, you, right. and if the simple fact that murder results in a guy being dead you know, and you still have a hard time figuring out, guys, why is that wrong? Who? I just, I don't want to meet you in the dark at night. Any Thank last words? Much. Wow. Um, I could say that I've enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> it has been interesting. Yeah. We've had that particular caller before. Boy, should we, I don't know that um, we have, do we have time for? I can give you another couple of quick uh, founding fathers quotes. Yeah. Um, I guess we're not going to take another. No, nah, we're not going to take another call. We're, we're sorry, Cody. We're, we're sorry, mm, Mike. Uh, yeah, thanks for staying on the line. Please call us back next week. We will be back again. Yeah, try calling early in the Here show. Here we go. We John can... Adams, the doctrine of the divinity of Jesus is made a convenient cover for absurdity. Hmm, my goodness. <laughs> um, Let's see, we got another Thomas minute or two Payne. to kill. Thomas um, Let's see. Accustom a people to believe that priests and clergy can forgive sins, and you will have sins in abundance. Thomas <laughs> Paine. Um, James Madison. Uh, what influence, in fact, have Christian ecclesiastical establishments had on civil society? In many instances, they have been up upholding the thrones of political tyranny. In no instance have they been seen as the guardians of the liberties of the people. Rulers who wish to subvert the public liberty have found in the clergy convenient auxiliaries. A just government instituted to secure and perpetuate liberty does not need the clergy. Mm -hmm. And a uh, final note on the, on the slavery issue in our last minute. Um, <laughs> I just, I'm just reminded by this book, of course, yeah, that, uh, that uh, the Bible makes no comments against slavery. So this was clearly a humanistic um, uh, of a movement that uh, came along that determined that was wrong. We determined as a species that it was wrong to hold human beings as property. Right. It, it whereas took the government of, by, and for the people to get together yeah. and decide that this that yeah. slavery, which was, which is effectively condoned in the Bible, yeah, so was first, really a bad thing, and we shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, first Corinthians uh, seven uh, twenty one and seven twenty four apparently are some uh, some. Uh, we could do a whole show on from that. Paul. We All right, folks. Left. Thanks okay. for watching. I want to especially extend a thank you to our wonderful crew, without whom we could not go on the air. This is really their show. We're just some morons who sit up here and talk. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Glasser once again for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Visit our website. Visit uh, our website. Join, Christ, huh? if, you're, if you're a Christian, join the Ask List and ask us uh, questions online. Christians, we, we don't, don't hate you. you. We, we just, just think you're wrong. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Tune in next week.